Uh, one of the themes that you're also hearing during the course of the morning is the difficulty dealing with uh, enormous data sets. We throw away much of what we use and of what we collect in biology and, and don't use it in clinical practice. And Brad Marin, who's a uh, cardiologist at the Brigham, has been really thinking about this in a variety of settings. And today he's going to tell us about its use uh, in uh, stratifying exercise dysfunction. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here. I am very excited to be discussing with you a novel approach uh, that hinges on the utilization of networks to understand the relationship between clinical variables as a way to define, classify, and risk stratify patients with complicated forms of cardiovascular disease. This group of collaborators that we assembled to accomplish this somewhat lofty mission uh, includes those who span a nice range of scientific interests, from physics, the truly unbiased contributors, to patients who ha uh, to uh, members who have boots on the ground at point of care clinical practice. And our goal was to bridge these uh, wide domains in order to uh, understand how we can provide a precision medicine correlate on the clinical side of that coin. To do that, I'd like to talk about uh, one illustration for uh, an example of our work, which focuses on exercise dysfunction, which is an independent risk factor for adverse outcome across the spectrum of cardiopulmonary disease. It's estimated that, for example, patients with heart failure, the prevalence of exercise dysfunction is over 50%. And as a strong driver for adverse outcome, it is surprising to us to learn that we know little about how to classify clinical variables that underpin the reason for that exercise dysfunction. So to address this, we studied patients who undergo invasive cardiopulmonary exercise testing, abbreviated here as ICPET, which involves the placement of a patient in an upright uh, cycle ergometer, who is then connected to a number of different tools for gathering a comprehensive range of clinical data, including invasive cardiopulmonary hemodynamics, oxygen uptake in the skeletal muscle, uh, gas exchange through a pneumotachograph at a mouth, mouthpiece, among other more conventional assessments uh, during exercise. And overall, this tool allows us to gain and gather information across seven specific functional domains uh, during at rest and also during peak exercise. Now, although over 100 variables are obtained for every invasive CPET performed, which is a test that's used both at Mass General Hospital and at Brigham, the truth of the matter is that we only utilize about six or seven variables to try to understand a clinical disorder. And that's complicated further by the branch logic and binary uh, methods that we use to, to catalog those data in which patients are uh, first assigned uh, across a specific variable and then shunted through a uh, branch logic method in the hopes that ultimately we'll be able to come up with one of a small number of clinical disorders. Now, as somebody that uses this test, which is potentially a very powerful tool in clinical practice, I can tell you that it's not uncommon to feel as though you're trying to fit a patient into a diagnosis rather than leveraging the value of the data you have in order to inform the clinician on the pathophysiology of that particular clinical encounter. As a result, there's substantial diagnostic overlap. On the other hand, many patients do not fit into a particular category. And overall, we have no patient-specific therapies for exercise dysfunction. To address this, we developed a novel mathematical code, which allowed us to integrate over 100 variables per patient and generate a network in which important relationships between multiple variables simultaneously can be illustrated in this particular way. From this effort, we focused on a, on a subnetwork of 10 nodes, which contained 15 edges or connections, and importantly, spanned five different functional measurements of the invasive CPET, providing a diverse range of information that could inform on the reason by which a patient had impaired exercise performance. 
We use this data to uh, go back and identify how many potential groups of patients we could discover from this uh, universe of 757 studies. And we were able to perform a principal component analysis and identify four distinct subgroups of patients with exercise dysfunction, which is illustrated here uh, according to the first and second principal components, although of course we have 10 variables, it is difficult to show 10 dimensions in a two-dimensional surface. And we next ask the question, this approach is intended to segregate out groups of patients by exercise profile. Were we successful? This heat map shows individual patient differences within each cluster across each of the 10 variables of the sub-network. And as you can see, there's a distinct gradient moving from cluster 4 to 3 to 2 to 1 in which the values for each variable in the sub-network start very low compared to the normalized mean in blue and end up very high to the normalized mean in red for the vast majority of variables. Furthermore, within each cluster, there was very little heterogeneity, suggesting we were able to use this method to differentiate four distinct exercise profiles. We looked at the clinical relevance of these exercise profiles and discovered that cluster assignment was associated with a significant difference in outcome measured here by all-cause hospitalization as a function of the days post ICPET test. This finding was uh, directionally similar for other important endpoints, including mortality. But perhaps most importantly, this method shows us that if we compare the clusters with conventional and traditional exercise diagnoses, that we've been able to successfully reorganize exercise profile in a way that is independent of current methods for diagnosing patients. As we can see here, we do not observe that predefined diagnoses tend to populate a particular cluster. By contrast, we see homogeneity in the distribution of these disorders across all four clusters, indicating that our definition of exercise profile did not hinge on a particular pre-existing disorder. Now the translational benefit or the translation, potential translational value of this approach has been uh, developed more recently in the form of an online risk calculator in which at point of care, a clinician who's uh, received results from an ICPET can enter values for each variable of the subnetwork and then the algorithm we have automatically assigns that patient to one of the four clusters and then calculates the associated three-year all-cause hospitalization risk associated with patients who were in that particular cluster. Now this is an important advance in the field of exercise physiology because to date there are no organized data that inform on risk stratification for ICPEP. And I'd also like to point out that this method uses a network approach to determine appropriate cluster assignment and therefore risk, which differs from more conventional approaches to risk stratification that hinge on multivariate analyses. In the latter, individual variables are weighted and risk is assigned according to a weight system. In our approach, we're defining exercise dysfunction as a collection of variables which hinge on each other as a way to define exercise impairment and as I showed you, determine risk stratification. I think opportunities for collaboration in this case are, are uh, multifold. First, we are interested in perhaps coupling with industry to develop an opportunity to integrate our algorithm into the reporting system of exercise uh, programs so that at point of care, an ordering physician can get an immediate assessment of risk stratification for that patient. This is particularly important given that the majority of cardiopulmonary physicians may not think about the detailed and complex nature of exercise dysfunction uh, daily. And this method would in turn provide them with a quick opportunity for risk stratification using a collection of variables. 
And furthermore, we believe that the code can be repurposed to provide a more nuanced approach to understanding other diseases, some of which have uh, cumbersome clinical definitions, such as pulmonary hypertension. I am a pulmonary hypertension doctor, so I should only be offending myself here. Uh, but other disorders in which there's heterogeneous, heterogeneous clinical uh, characterization, including valvular heart disease, or in which the definitions do not satisfy the totality of clinical risk, such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, as well as other very complex and heterogeneous disorders, such as myocarditis, and perhaps for the vast universe of patients that suffer from heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Thank you for your attention.